This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Yael Barda, and Gilad Halperin is away, but we'll be back for our next episode. Each week, we bring you conversations with authors about their books and research and other things that we like. If you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon member by going to our homepage, tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Scroll to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. Some of you have been doing this for months and years, and we can't thank you enough. Our guest today is Professor of Geography at Ben Gurion University, Oren Iftachil. He has written and edited several books and very numerous articles. Most recently, he has published a new book in Hebrew called Otzma Ve'adama, Power and Land, that aggregates many articles he's written on regimes, identities, and space in Israel-Palestine. Professor Oren Iftachil, hello and welcome. Shalom, shalom, hello. So as a preliminary question, can you tell our listeners what we learn when we look at the political and social landscape of the country, focusing on land and power? What does the analysis based on space do for us? Well, um, there is no question that uh, power is constituted by space. Uh, it's not the only uh, building block of power, but it's a very central one, and it's one that is quite often concealed by by culture, by law, by rhetoric. But uh, the very, very basic building blocks of power quite often are constructed around space and around land. Uh, the obvious ones are, of course, borders, territories, homes, settlements, all of them are a configuration of power that are built through space. Uh, and f- even more uh, subtle ones. say like body, uh, the way we dress, the way our home is constructed, the value of our home, the exclusion and, and inclusion of particular neighborhoods, localities. I'll give you an example. Very recently in Israel, it's part of the judicial coup that we probably will talk about. One of the new laws is to make uh, selection committees to hundreds of settlements in Israel or localities in Israel that can actually choose the who will buy a house there and who is not, very much against any concept of, of liberal democracy. So here you see the power to control space is very, very related to social power, to economic power, and to ethnic power. So the whole book is built around this axis of critique of power in general and critique of spatial power in particular. And one last point is that landed power is long-term. Economic power, educational power, all these are very important, legal power, but a law can be changed. Once you set things in land, they're usually long-term, multi-generational, and they're very, very much influencing a social structure. So one of the striking elements of the book is the way you address not only politics and economics of land use, but you also relate to the role of land in Israeli culture. While we know there's a connection between legal regimes and cultural imagination and identity, not many geographers and planners have addressed that. Why do you focus on the landscape in song? And are those songs still relevant for the analysis of Israeli politics and society? Well, of course, uh, a very important element of uh, constructing power is also uh, the landscape. And the identity that is ingrained uh, in the homeland, in the, uh, in, in the very, very uh, aesthetics of what you see every day, but not only what you see, but how it's framed, how you actually filter it through uh, your cultural uh, optics in terms of giving it value. So one of the chapters of the book is uh, analysis of how uh, Jews, and to some extent also Palestinians, Sing the homeland. And when you sing the homeland, it's actually a very, very good focal point to see how you beautify, how you normalize, how you actually relish 
many of the things that are um, problematic, um, war, uh, violence, domination, uh, eviction, but you can actually, you know, you can write about eviction or destruction, but you can write about rebuilding and return, which is the Palestinian Jewish kind of dialectics. Uh, and um, I did a study at that time when I wrote that about 15 years ago. Basically, I reviewed all the songs, all the songs that were written about the land. How do Israeli Jews sing the land? All the songs that have melody to it. And it was absolutely fascinating. One fascinating aspect is that there are no Palestinians. There are no Arabs. The land is empty. You write about the hills, you write about the villages, you write about the Bible, you write about so many other aspects. And you know, very important people that shaped Israeli cultures like Naomi Shemer or Eud Manor. And they're genius in actually weaving together a narrative, but the, the country is empty. On the positive side, they're also brilliant in connecting Jewish history, Jewish uh, grievances, Jewish uh, fears into the land and beautifying it. Uh, Yoram Ta'alev is another one. Uh, so this is really, really powerful in terms of educating and building the identity of Israeli Jews. Likewise, Palestinians too. You know, they sing a lot about the land, absolutely a lot. But contrary to what I said, the Jew is always there either explicitly or implicitly. There is always the tyrant, the invader, the settlers. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mahmoud Darwish has this famous line, a very famous line, line that uh, what the settler is mostly fearful of is the port, right? Because they tell the truth. And so um, just to connect it to today's events, of course, this was written a long time ago, but in the... Uh, in the uh, town circles and the streets of the current protests where tens of thousands of people sing songs. One of the most common songs is En li Eretz Acheret, I don't have another country. And you hear, I don't know, in Beersheva where, you know, 10,000 people sing this song. They all know the words and it connects them very, very strongly to this kind of protest, which in one hand it's, I love this country. אין לי ארץ אחרת, גם אם אדמתי בוערת, רק מילה בעברית חודרת, I don't have another land, even if it's burning, only a Hebrew word actually penetrates me, and then it says, I will not be silent for this country until it changes its face. So even when you protest against the country, the cultural building blocks of who you are is there in the song. Yes, and mm. the Palestinians are still absent yeah. from it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you about the, the organization of the book that is really very, very rich and wide as it encompasses these the different aspects of land and power in, in every um, social and cultural and economic aspect. Um, so you first look at institutions and legal regimes, then identities, and then you look about... F- at futures um, and possibilities, a lot of them, um, and that's, I'm going to ask you in one of our next questions about the city. But tell us a little bit about this choice, um, legal regime, identity, future. Why? Well, first we have to look at how this book was organized. And I'm sure our listeners would know that uh, uh, the lingua franca of academia is English. So even here in Israel, rather than write in our native language, Hebrew, Arabic, we write in English. So most of my articles and books actually were in English, and we'll return to that point later on. So the book was a conscious attempt actually to translate or to rewrite it in Hebrew and to give uh, Hebrew readers and students, it's much easier for them to read in Hebrew, a sort of a cross-section of my work over the last 15 years. Uh, So these were three, I suppose, main headings, or maybe, gateways into my work. Some of it is on regimes, some of it is on identities. And because I'm also an urban planner, a professional urban planner that worked in many countries around the world as an urban planner, and also a political analyst, I know how important the future is. So this is the way I organize it. So, you know, it's very important regimes. Um, Much of my work is critical from a maybe structural perspective. And this is I think the beauty of it, the structural analysis says, it's not what you see exactly. You have to look for the powers below the surface. So regimes is exactly that. Regimes 
is the translation of power into institutions and rules and everyday life. This is what regimes do. So, of course, the land regime, you know, we are all told that we are in a liberal democracy and there is free market and all these kind of statements. But when you actually look at the way the land regime is organized in terms of the institutions, the people, the staff, the, what we talked before about the selection committees, the way land was nationalized and who is it allocated to, I suddenly start to understand the social system of Israel-Palestine. The same also with the legal regimes and with the urban regimes and uh, all this kind of thing, how cities are organized, for example, will return to it, um, and how the law is organized. The law in terms of spatial law in Israel, for example, it has an amazing function. It enables the dispossession, but it also hides it at the same time, right? It gives you all this kind of, of statements like, we only use the Ottoman law, and which is true. Israel uses the Ottoman law, but it distorts it in a way that the Ottomans and the British never did, and therefore it actually conceals the dispossession uh, by saying, well, this is just the Ottoman law, and so on and so forth. Regimes are very important to understand where we are with the forces below the, the surface. And then, of course, identities are very important to some extent in the opposite way. The identities, of course, the galvanize people's social life, political life, but they also lock you of resistance. And I think that's very important. So I spent quite a lot of time about Mizrahi identity in Israel, which starts with the Jews that are sent to the periphery, marginalize their um, identity, scorn, their culture is wiped out. And their forms, uh, you know, the, the, the Mizrahi identity is actually invented in Israel. People that come from Iran, Iraq, Turkey, all the way to Morocco. But it's formed as a non-Western resistance to the way Zionism is built in the beginning as a European Eurocentric identity. The same I go through, of course, Palestinian Arab, Bedouin identity. I look at uh, Russian identity. And I also look at elites that are losing their power to some extent, like the kibbutzim identity and how they hang on to some kind of form of power. So I think identity is a very good way to look at at how a society is structured. It's much more dynamic. Borders are porous. There is some assimilation, some segregation. And uh, there's also the religious el element that you focus on oh, yeah. in one of the chapters that's very important. And also that's a moving target, right? Because of the shifts and changes in people's daily life. Absolutely. And, 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 and the way the religious uh, group in Israel, which is actually small, People wouldn't believe it, but it's quite small, 15 to 20 percent, how it's elevated itself to a position of power through the land, through the settlement, through a conscious attempt not to be just one car in the train, but to be the locomotive. That's how they say, to drag people behind them. And so their identity, which is very, very strong, it's ethnic, it's religious, it's national, it has its own uh, uh, education system, it has its own settlements, uh, own political parties. So uh, uh, identities are both the control and the resistance. And then future, the thing, is also something that is underrated. Oh, going back one sentence to identities, Western academia has a great problem with identity, you know? Both liberalism and Marxism, which are the two main paradigms of understanding the world, have great hardship. What do we do with this kind of identity? Is it just a relic of the past? Is it something that disturbs us from our class struggle or... But I approach it differently. I start from the bottom. I say, what's important for people? And I see that identity is very, very important. That doesn't negate the fact that there's a class struggle. That doesn't negate the fact that there is, uh, you know, uh, aspiration for freedom. But it is a main infrastructure of society. And this is why I dealt it with that in, in depth. Now, future, I think, is another thing that is quite underrated in in social science and in, 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 in academia. Although I think it's gaining steam, right? More more and more we're, we're, yeah. we, we see people thinking about the future, but it's still marginal. Yeah, it is. And also identities recently with racial capitalism and with some other uh, you know, concepts. Uh, uh, decolonization is, of course, based on the colonized identities. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad that it's happening. But when I grew up academically in the... Mm, giving up my age, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was a non-issue. Nobody spoke about it. And it was only people from the global south and global east that started to really look at it. In the beginning, they call it, carefully, they call it post-colonial. Mm -hmm. But it really is colonial, you know, how the world is colonized and decolonized and, and, and even new forms of colonization that are internal, 
like say the Muslims in, in India now are colonized by the Hindus. So colonization is not just European, it's also a form of domination that is ongoing and by identity. Which is a yeah, great yeah, segue yeah. to the, my next question. Mm. So you write about the way colonial discourse in Israel has been silenced over the years. But there is now this extraordinary political moment during the, these last eight months since uh, the current government announced the judicial overhaul or coup, depending on which side you're on. And some write that this government began annexation de jure. Of the West Bank. Of yeah. the West Bank. So... There is much more an awareness, I think, at this moment than ever before. Um, can you tell us a little bit about wh- how you see the silencing of the colonial discourse, both in academia in Israel and beyond it? And is there a change right now? Yeah, it's very good to connect this kind of studies that go back 15 years, even more sometimes, to the present moment. And the present moment is an amazing moment. Uh, the present moment is lasting, you know, seven or eight months of the middle classes, you know, the people that were the elites in Israel actually rebelling against the government that is trying to shatter the system, the ethnocratic system. I used to call it ethnocracy because it's based on ethnic logic, ethnic hierarchy, but it has a thin layer of democracy on it, procedural democracy. And that was the balance that all people talk about, Jewish and democratic states. You know, I don't think this can hold this kind of contradiction. But what this construct of Jewish and democratic or ethnocratic does is hide a colonization process. If you don't look at the world as a picture, if you look at it as a movie, not as a slide, but as a Hollywood movie, and you look at a hundred years of Jewish colonization of Palestine, and I start the book by six simple maps about Jewish settlements that begins with 17 settlements during the Ottoman period, etc., and reaches today 1,186, I think. You know, incredible settlement movement and almost the mirror image among the Palestinians of shrinking and shrinking space until it's sort of stabilizing in, in enclaves in the last few uh, decades. I said to the people, how can you not call it settler colonialism? This is just in front of your eyes. But yet... In 70 years, I'm saying 70, not 75 years of Israeli academia, there is total silence. I think without being particularly proud of myself, I'm just speaking truth to the power. It's not inventing anything. I'm not Einstein. I'm not Oppenheimer. I'm not sort of breaking new paradigms. I'm just presenting what's on the ground. And some Palestinians have written about it, by the way, not so many. Uh, uh, And uh, this frustrates me a, a great deal because... It's, uh, it's, it's a foundation. It's like you want to uh, understand how the relation between two people and you have to tell if they are married or not married, right? It's a foundation of the relations. So the foundation of the, the relation, the regime, the group uh, uh, relations in Israel-Palestine is the colonization process. It's not alone. And here I have an argument with some of the avid kind of supporter of colonial paradigm among the Palestinians because there are other factors. There's liberalism, there is religion, there's many other things. Jews themselves are refugees, et cetera, et cetera. But there's definitely a settler colonial project. So that was very frustrating. I'm saying 70 or 65 years and not 75 because in the last few years, there is change in Israeli academia. Basically, I think mostly people like you joining in and young Palestinian scholars. And that is a slight change. There's maybe a dozen Palestinians now that work in Israeli uh, universities, uh, and they actually start to raise the, the colonial paradigm. And that's very, very important to understand, first of all. And then, of course, to resist and to negate and to unpack. And this is where the current protest comes in as a bit of a surprise, by the way. I was surprised, even though for a long time I was warning people about the collapse of the Israeli regime because as you said if you look at the West Bank if you look at the Negev where I come from the Nakab if you look at the what they call the mixed cities it's obviously not democratic all right there is hierarchy of, of identities and 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 civil statuses yeah we're gonna we're gonna yeah. go deeply into that in, a, in just but, a few minutes but it is I have to admit I mean I always called for resistance for for uh, you know trying to to see the regime to to, to see the the anti-democratic elements in it. Uh, uh, but it is amazing that hundreds of thousands of people go to the street to say 
almost exactly that. Not exactly, they don't talk about colonialism. Many of them actually still deny that there is occupation, but they are against a regime that is unequal, the regime that is corrupt, the regime that is anti-democratic. And I think for us, people that were waiting for some kind of mass resistance, this is, um, you know, like rain in the middle of the desert. So this is why I totally join this, and I, th I know you are very active in it, uh, to try and open the crack and while you look critically at, at this government, the regime, and the people that lead these governments are settlers that actually, as you say, step by step, uh, working on annexation, de jure, not just de facto, uh, this kind of two, uh, two aspects of the, of the protest will have to join hands sooner or later. So, your book traces a tra trajectory even in the subtitle itself, right? From ethnocracy, which you just explained to us, to creeping apartheid. Can you briefly define what you mean by these terms? And can you very briefly describe the process of moving from ethnocracy to the creeping apartheid? Well, there are certain, you know, Israel or any other settler uh, society is not one society. There's many strands and many paradigms. And there is a, an ongoing conflict, profound conflict in, in Israel between the colonial and the democratic. And uh, while in the beginning there is obviously a very big push of a colonial establishment of a Jewish state with the Palestinian Nakba, with two-thirds of the Palestinians becoming refugees, with 450 villages being demolished, etc., etc., the country is stabilizing and trying to create itself into a democracy. Uh, with more or less agreed upon borders, although that's, of course, you know, depending on the wars, etc. But there was kind of an overall consensus that the area within the Green Line is Israel proper, and that should be the future of the Israeli polity. Um, and, and with, of course, many other um, factors happening, but during the 90s and 2000s, it appeared to be stabilizing to some extent. There was um, the Oslo Agreement, there was the uh, in disengagement from Gaza, uh, there was very much slowing down of settlement activity. Within the Green Line, it's almost stopped. Don't forget that about 700 settlements were built inside the Green Line. There was internal colonization of Israel, as well as the West Bank also. It slowed down a great deal uh, during Rabin and during Olmer time as prime ministers. So that's where I observed and I did a comparative study of, of countries like Estonia, like Northern Ireland, like Sri Lanka. I went to all these places and ethnocracy to some extent was established. That is a thin democratic layer and beyond that there is still ethnic control, but not apartheid. That is nobody is denied of political rights and no de jure strat stratification of, of citizenship. All this change with the other arm of Israeli politics that is becoming stronger and stronger over time. This is a settlement and Jewish supremacy. And we see that what the, the, the period where Israel tried to stabilize as, as a stable ethnocracy has been shattered by the geography of, of new settlements and by the ongoing attack on Palestinian and Arab rights and also some other rights of non-Jews uh, that come to Israel, like refugees from Africa, foreign workers, etc. So gradually you can see an apartheid system evolving in front of your eyes where you have separate and unequal and you have it de facto, but also de jure, where Israel now controls without any doubt and also without hiding it between the Jordan and the sea, controls everything the Palestinians do, birth, uh, travel, uh, ec academia, economic development, even the ludicrous side of, of, of Qatar wanting to fund the Hamas in Gaza that Israel is actually transferring the money to, to Hamas. Uh, and of course, in the West Bank too, every movement that Palestinian minister has to do, it has to be approved by Israel, and uh, not to mention construction and travel, etc., etc. So with that kind of arm of Israeli society expanding Jewish control, suddenly we see that under Israeli regime, you have different types, different classes of citizenship, which resemble South Africa, where I sort of term it to make a parallel, white, colored, and black. That's the whites are the Jews that have full rights in the whole space. The colors are the Palestinian with Israeli citizenship that have partial rights. They are in a Jewish state, they are a minority, uh, and they don't have the same political and economic rights. And then you have the black all inverted commas, 
that the Palestinians, five and a half million Palestinians without political rights, although the Israeli government controlled to a great extent, directly or indirectly, their life. And also I have this growing group of what I call gray people that are in the gray space in between, probably four or 500,000 people that are neither Palestinian nor Jewish, are very, very much now part of our society in terms of the economy, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the temporary labor, et cetera, et cetera. So this is happening in front of our eyes. And I would say that the apartheid project has overridden, overruled, uh, and dominated the more democratic and ethnocratic projects. And, and, and now that's where we are at. Let's move, move towards um, um, the local. And in the part about futures, a major concern of yours is the role of cities in creating equality and sustainable life. And you're also very involved, both not only academically, but also personally and as an activist, in um, Be'er Sheva and its environs. It's an important case study for you for, for, for many uh, reasons. How does urban life hold a promise for sustainable future? So, and how can the local change the whole regime? Um, I think this becomes uh, such an important question that I was reading uh, because of the massive preparation now for the local elections that for the first time, I think people in Israel um, seem to be looking at it almost as important as the national elections too. And so that this is a moment to talk about the role of the city mm-hmm. in national politics. Yeah, well, overall, as you know, as I explained before, um, we are in a very worrying process of the country becoming more and more apartheid-like regime. Uh, and people like us, like you and me and many other people, are looking for ways to resist and to uh, create a different narrative and different... Uh, spaces where this can be uh, changed, transformed. One of them is the city. Uh, I'm interested in it because I'm an urban planner by profession and I do quite a lot of projects in cities, uh, not as much as before I went to academia, but nonetheless I'm involved as an advisor for social justice, advisor for minorities in the city, etc. Now the city has a different logic to the state and a different logic to the colonial. Fundamentally, it's different. Uh, there is a famous book by, by uh, Asha Min that's called Thinking Like a City, which is a response to James Scott's famous book, Thinking Like a State. Seeing Like a State. Seeing Like a State, yeah. So it's seeing like a city. Yeah, you're right. Uh, and there, you know, many of the logics that are territory, law, citizenship, all the formalities uh, uh, are almost turned on the head in the city where it's porous, there's no boundaries, you can come in and out. Uh, um, Presence is more important than your papers, right? If you're in the city, you buy in the shop, you go to the school, you work, etc., etc. Your identity and history are far less important, right? Because it's about the present, it's about the future. See, it is a future-oriented. I want to bring money in. I want to uh, become stronger. I want to uh, develop this park. I want to make, uh, you know, a sporting event. I want to... So, uh, uh, while it's not, uh, you know, there is no direct conflict uh, between city and, and state because they are actually occupying different paradigms and different logics of organizing society. The cities are much more connected to a world network of cities. Right? You quite often have twin cities. You quite often have uh, culture that actually move from city to city. Immigrants, immigrants around the world, 95% of them go to cities. Uh, this is why cities often also have in there, despite the liberalism and the capitalism, quite often they also have apartheid system in them. You know, the, the great example is Dubai. You know, it's, it's, it operates like a city state, but it has 90% of people that don't have citizenship rights because they're immigrants. So, um, in that respect, the city offers a different perspective to the state. And in Israel, Palestine, it has some kind of a promise, I would say limited promise, because the powerful impact of nationalism and colonialism. But nonetheless, they do have a different logic, sometimes in the cracks. Where we sit now in Tel Aviv is the you know, epitome of liberalism in Israel, Palestine. It's a city that is open, a city that supports gay rights, supports gender equality, supports many of the things that the regimes, uh, the regimes in Israel, but also to some extent in Palestine, are against freedom of movement. Forget who you are. Forget where you come from. You are a Tel Avivian, right? Mm, 
but still in terms of class, I'd say. Yeah, there is a class system, absolutely. <laughs> still, you know, yeah. And, uh, pretty harsh one. Yeah, and also Tel Aviv is very expensive. So there is, you know, and all the cities around it, Ranana and Rishon, let's see, are very expensive. Coming from Be'er Sheva, I know that my nice house in Be'er Sheva probably can buy a two-bedroom apartment here. That's all, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, there is obviously that. And that also comes hand in hand, usually. Liberalism, openness, being part of the globalizing society, you know, network of global cities uh, comes with a price, an incredible price, with speculation and with gentrification and with, with, with a kind of processes. So, you know, there's nowhere to hide from oppression, but it's a different oppression. And it's, a, what I would say, more porous and more inclusive oppression than states, especially ethnocratic states and apartheid states. So what I think there is a promise in the city is to build a democracy. And many places around the world, there is this tension, right? London versus Britain. London in the, in the Brexit said, we are staying in Europe, right? New York during Trump's, one of major Trump's, I don't know, pulling out of the Paris Agreement of the climate change. New York and Los Angeles says, we are signing the, the climate. So, so there is this kind of tension around the world. And it's a shaping, it's a, it's a, it's a tension that shapes the 21st century. Delhi versus Moody, right? Delhi was the, you know, the... Istanbul won against Erdogan. So uh, we, ha we see that and, and Tel Aviv very much. But, but it's, it's it, you know, so direct democracy or closer democracy, like Hannah Arendt told us, you know, representing democracy is not the solution. Hannah Arendt says, and other people say, active involvement. That creates a real democracy. So it has to be smaller and it has to be urban. It has to be uh, where actually people can influence. I'm not sure that Israeli cities are such prime examples of democracy because they have corruption and they have uh, mayors that are super powerful because they've, they've voted personally. But nonetheless, it's far more democratic than uh, the rest. So I think all of us should invest a lot in, in local election. We in Beersheba, I'm part of, 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 of uh, first time ever having an Arab Jewish party called Shutafut, Shiraka. And we are uh, very partnership. much... Yeah, partnership. Uh, so it's a possibility of getting some people into the council. Uh, but I have to warn about that, that the promise of the city in, in Europe, in Africa, and in Asia, which uh, is, is considerable, is lessened in Israel-Palestine because the incredible weight of, of the national and, 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 and colonial struggle. And Jerusalem is very much an example of that. Jerusalem is almost not, it doesn't see like a city, right? It almost sees like a state within the city. Of course, still there is movement between West and East and there's a bit more freedom to the Palestinian there than the Palestinian in the West Bank. But uh, smaller cities in Israel like Afula or Carmiel or Dimona are very nationalist and, and the minorities they have, a, have a hard time. But we still, that's an arena where we have some chance of investing and creating democracy from below. So we're almost at the end of our time, but I wanted to, to ask you about Land for All and the prospects for a confederation that you write about in one of the chapters as the most viable solution that you perceive. So from your perspective, why is such a model useful? Well, you know, looking at the futures and looking at resisting the, the deepening apartheid, now I even call it deepening apartheid, not just creeping, because as you said, there is actual formal move to annex people without citizenship. And that's, uh, you know, very, very worrying. Uh, and I think it should worry uh, we're talking to people to to people around the world in this in this uh, podcast. So it should worry uh, many people around the world, especially Jewish diasporas, that are interested. And I think it's important for both sides. You know, we very much connected to the Jewish diaspora. Jewish diaspora, I think, has an interest uh, and care about the fact that the Jewish homeland would be democratic. So in that respect, uh, one of the other fronts, not the what we talked about, the urban, but on an overall scale is to reach agreement and reach peace. And there's no doubt that the more we have conflict, the more apartheid will deepen. It's so easy to have pretexts of security, of Islam, of many other uh, pretexts that even the court will approve to exclude people from full membership. So uh, a group of us, exactly 10 years from now, you know, got together and said the two main models on the table, which is a two-state solution where you actually separate between Palestinian and Jews with a sort of hard cut inside the geography, 
uh, uh, or the one state, where the two nations will actually hold one state uh, democratically, both of them are unrealistic and also unjust to some extent, right? Partition will create a, a, a ghetto Palestinian state that will be constant conflict with, uh, with Israel and will uh, and not enable the Palestinians properly to develop because Israel will control all sides of that poor little state. Uh, one state will annul the self-determination uh, of both Palestinians and, and Jews and especially the uh, right that Palestinians have, Jews already have it, to control uh, a state apparatus. So in other words, we reach the, the conclusion that you cannot partition the land, but you cannot also fully unite it. And there are the models around, like the confederation model, that allows this kind of mixed geographies, yet different collective rights to exist. And we find that this, is, uh, this offers a possibility. This offered a possibility to get out of the maze, out of the abyss that we're in, with constructing a, a brighter future, future not only of peace but of justice as well. That the Palestinians and the Jews could have self-determination, or you could say the Palestinians and the Israelis, because also the Palestinians in Israel are part of the Israeli polity. Uh, yet the homeland between the Jordan and the sea that ironically, you know, we can also look a little bit ironic in this. Not everything is also so serious. I mean, Jews and Palestinians vow that this is the homeland that they are willing to die for. Even worse, that they are willing to kill for. But it's the British and the French that actually constructed it, right? It never existed before, this kind of holy land. But now it's holy for the people. Now it's sacred for the people, for Palestinians and for Jews. And it's exactly the same space. You can go to many shops, for example, in the old city of Jerusalem, and you buy a key ring with a map, and it will be the same map. One of them is blue and white, one of them is green, white, and, and, and black. So, and you have, you have pictures of this in the book, yeah, too. Yeah, in the book I have this picture, etc. So we have the same homeland, we have two peoples mixed together, uh, uh, and we have two peoples that have the right for self-determination, approved by the international arena, etc., etc., and the Palestinians are yet to achieve it we find that the only way forward is to think about the, the sharing the homeland and yet have two political spaces in it. A bit like Belgium, perhaps, a bit like Bosnia, places that had long-term, multi-generation conflicts and seemed to resolve them through a confederation. Sometimes confederations like Canada, for example, is another place where the French Canadians and the English Canadians and the natives, uh, First Nation, etc., had conflict and confederations seemed to have uh, galvanized, sometimes it moves into a federation in the long term, like Canada has, even though it's called a confederation, it's basically a federation. But I'm not sure about the future at that stage, nobody can predict it, but uh, it's very, very certain that this is a path that can create peace without sacrificing the rights of the Jews or the Palestinians to the entire homeland that they feel is there, they have very strong emotions about it, and yet they have to respect one another's political rights, not in a kind of partitioned, walled uh, security landscape that will not bring peace, but to something that can actually bring reconciliation for both nations. Lastly, something more technical. Mm. Where can the listeners access your work in English? <laughs> well, as I said before, much of my work has been written in English to start with. And also, you know, I lived in Australia in the past. So I published my first, my beginning of the career is in Australia, etc. And I'm, by the way, it was very interesting for an Israeli like me, from the very, very mainstream, to go out of the country, to work with Aborigines and immigrants in Australia, and suddenly to look back at Israel and learn from it. And I think that happened to you also when you moved to, to America for a few years. Um, well, there's a series of books, maybe 10 books that I've written in English. I would like to mention Ethnocracy which is one of the major books that I've written. It was 2006 with Pennsylvania Press. There's a book that I did with Ahmad Amara and Ismail Abu Saad that is called Indigenous Injustice, which it came out with Harvard University Press, and it compares different indigenous peoples around the world with the Bedouins in Israel, uh, Palestine. By the way, one of the major issues I'm very involved with is the campaign for the rights of the Bedouins and the planning committees in the courts, in the West Bank, etc. We didn't have much time to talk about, but it's a very sore point. Uh, and it's very similar to other indigenous peoples around the world. And also some of my work in English, I was uh, uh, the chairman of the uh, committee of B'Tselem. So we publish a lot of reports in English that I'm still on the, on the editorial committee. Um, and uh, one other book for 
people are interested in planning is the power of planning that uh, I did in English. Uh, and that also has uh, many chapters comparing planning and its impact on oppression, but also on liberation, as we said, and constructing a better future. So anybody is looking for Yiftach El, a name like this, which is, you know, unrepeatable, <laughs> <laughs> coming from the Bible, uh, will find my publication in English. Great. Mm. Oren Yiftach El, thank you very much. Yeah. And many thanks to Itai Shelem, the manager of TLV Studios. Now a request. Most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app, and we would love you for, to consider writing us a review. You too can support us by going on the website, tlv1.fm slash review and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive with probably close to a thousand interviews now. Like us on Facebook. Follow me and Gilad Halperin on Twitter. And join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, goodbye. Goodbye.